Well, good morning. My name is David, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church. It's in our name. I mean, sure, we shorten it, right? We, we shorten it sometimes. We say, I go to Walden Church, but if someone were to ask, what kind of church is this? We would say, we are a community church. Now, I suppose you could also say non-denominational, right? But I, I think it's kind of weird to define yourself by what you're not, especially considering the irony is that non-denominational is now a denomination. We're a Bible church. We're a believer's church, a church that speaks the truth. We are a neighborhood church. When the church planters first asked Walden if they could build a church, the only condition was that it had to be a church for everyone, which is great because God loves community. From day one, God's intention has always been community. Genesis begins, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. He says afterwards, this is good. This is very good. He enjoyed it and he rested when he was done. Most fantastically done. Now there is nothing left undone. All the work of all of creation is finished. We were made as a completed work of God's genius. And to be separate like God the Father and the Son and the Spirit, but also to be one like him, one in community. This is what the church ought to look like. We were made as a whole being with a desire to be with one another from day one. That's always been God's intention, community. God is singular, but he has three aspects, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is many, but he is one. And as such, we are made in his image. You are mind, body, and spirit, but you are one body. Well, then it should be as no surprise to you that it's also God's game plan for his church. We are made in his image, so we are made to connect to one another, just like the Trinity. Well, if creation is so wonderful and so perfect, then what ruined it? Sin. Oh, I get it, because sin, right, yeah, that's lying and cheating and drinking and smoking and all that, all that bad stuff. No, that is not what sin is. Quite simply, sin are the things that break fellowship with God and break community with other people. Sadly, we've reduced sins down to actions. And we've said, well, if I can stop the actions, I can stop sinning. Even people who are not religious will say, well, if there is a heaven and I get up there, I think all my good deeds will allow me in. The good I have done will outweigh the bad. But it's not a scale. It's not a scale balancing good and bad. Sin would ask, have you separated yourself from God? Have you separated yourself from other people? Have you broken fellowship? Have you broken community? Larry Crabb wrote a book called Connecting. And in his book, he says, we have made a terrible mistake. For most of the century, we have strongly defined sin as disorders and passed on their treatment to trained specialists. But damaged psyches are not the problem. The problem is disconnected souls. What we need is connection. What we need is a healing community. And he's right. You know, before COVID, about 41% of America infrequently attended church, or not at all. 
But after COVID, that number is now 56%. And it includes our youngest generation, millennials and Gen Xers, being now the least likely to attend church. Before the pandemic, about 77% of America said they were Christian. Now it's 68%. And we're not just declining in numbers. We are declining in belief. Less and less do Christians feel that truth is important. What are all the excuses that we're hearing now? Uh, we're hearing, you know, I'm, I'm taking a break from church for a while. You know, we, we've done our time. You know, we, we've served. It's time for somebody else to step up. We're just too busy. You know, the church doesn't have to be church and meet in a building. I've heard people say this. You've heard people say this. And on the surface, you know, we can nod and agree. Sounds right. Doesn't it sound right? I mean, it doesn't sound bad. I get it. I feel you. But is it breaking fellowship? Is it breaking community? You know, something wonderfully powerful happens in community. And if you want to experience God, you need to be in community. God is where we are when we deliberately gather in his name. Matthew 18 says, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Can you imagine if somebody were to say, well, I'm, I'm taking a break from my family right now. I mean, I'm, I'm too busy to love my children. You know, it's time for somebody else to raise my kids. Sounds absurd, doesn't it? And it's our fault. It is. It's, our, it's even my fault. It's my fault. So often we say, go to church. Are you going to church? I'm sorry, I have not been at church I'm coming to church. We've made church a location. We've made church a place. I go to that church. That church? No, not that one, that one. Look at how church began. Peter said to the crowd, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3000 souls. Notice first that it's the gospel. It's the gospel message that attracts people and saves people. Before there's a single program, before there's a single building built, before there is a Bible study, before potlucks, before lights, before sound systems, there is the gospel. In one day, the church grows by 3,000 people. 3,000 people added to community, not added to a building, not added to a program, not a Bible study. First and foremost, people are made to connect to God. They need to feel free. They need to have their sins forgiven connected because of God's grace for church. That first common denominator was faith, faith in Jesus. What happens next? They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is the game plan. That is it. That's the whole plan right there. That is church. Acts 2.42. Of course, it doesn't need to take place in a designated church building. And for all those people who say, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian, you are 100% right. You're 100% right. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. 
but you definitely have to be in community. Skipping church is not a sin. Skipping community is. They devoted themselves to four things. The word of God, meeting together, food, and prayer. Our shared love of Jesus should naturally drive us to want to be around other Christians. And when we're together, we talk about the Bible, we share a meal, we pray for each other. That's church. Nobody's forced, (laughs) right? Nobody's guilt-tripped. We have freedom, and it's just our joy in Jesus that compels us, that makes us want to go. And then look what happens as the result. Verse 43 says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. When people come together in Jesus' name, when authentic worship is experienced, there's, there's no better feeling. There's, there's no drug or high that can replace the feeling that comes to you when you experience signs and wonders. Last Monday, several of us got to witness 90 kids singing and memorizing Bible verses. That was a sign and a wonder. And when you experience one thing, you want to experience something like that again. You want it more and more. Verse 44 says, All the believers met together constantly and shared everything they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those who had need. Did you ever wonder what would make somebody do that? Why why would you share your property with other people? It was those signs and wonders we were talking about. And you know, when you see what God can do with $20, you get excited and you ask, well, what could God do with $1,000? And you know what? You don't have to tithe to be a Christian. But that's not why we give. We give to see the kingdom advance because we need tools. Workers need tools. Workers need resources. Just, just as a for instance, okay? Our uh, Bible club that happens over at the school, one family, one family bought all the Bibles for Bible club. It was over $1,000. One church family bought all the shirts for Bible club. That was over $1,000. Not because it makes them a Christian, And the church did not tell them to do it. They did it because they love Jesus and because they want to be a part of the signs and wonders. Do you want to help with Bible Club? (laughs) We still need help. We, We need to buy three boxes of mixed potato chips every single week. Each box is about $17 at Walmart. And we need enough for three more weeks. And... We can't have too much because we use the same snacks for Joy Squad. So that's just two ministries at this church, right? That's just Joy Squad and Bible Club. We also have grief support groups. We have the one-on-one Christian counseling. We give towards local charities and nonprofits right here in Montgomery and Conroe. So all the money you give helps your neighborhood. It helps your community. One more. 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Did you notice that? They were a church more than just one day a week. Yes, they got together as a big group, but the Bible says they also got together as a small group. They were first friends. They were neighbors. A church is also not attendance. If if, if we're to be a community, then it's not about counting heads. It's about knowing each other. I'm going to say something, but um, you you might not agree. (laughs) But I think some of you have been attending church your entire life. but you've never experienced church. Church is not pews or lights. It's 
It's not even a style of music. Church is also not gossip or cliques. Church does not mean tax exempt. It doesn't mean Sunday morning. It doesn't mean King James. A church is a Christ-centered community. It's where admitted sinners receive grace, where people are free from judgment, where friendships are real, and where God is worshipped. And then, verse 47 says, Every day the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. If the church acts like the church, if the church worships like it's supposed to, is a community like it's supposed to be, if we're truthful to the scriptures, if we show grace, if we offer forgiveness as friends who enjoy getting together, not just for formal worship, but also during the week. In other words, if we're building community with God and building community with each other, then God will grow the church. I know COVID messed things up and we all got out of the habit, but this game plan has worked for 2000 years and I believe it'll work until Christ returns. So let's talk about one of the things that we say around here. Why does the church exist? For two reasons, more Christians and mature Christians. Let's talk about mature Christians first. And no, mature doesn't have anything to do with age. In fact, anyone who has received Christ is in need of growing mature. New believers need maturity. They are the new soil who have just received the word of God. They are the first who should grow deeper down or else their seed will not bear much fruit. Who else needs to grow mature? Well, people who are suffering. People who are suffering need maturity. God uses our trials in our life to help us grow stronger, but they can also cause us to stumble. Mature plants grow deep roots so that when suffering comes or evil comes or loss or temptation, you are able to withstand it. People who feel alone need maturity. What do I mean? I mean, if you're one of the only Christians at work or you're the only Christian in your home or in your sorority or your class, or perhaps you're even a single parent raising kids, when you feel alone, you can feel isolated and you can feel weak. And so as we grow mature, we are able to develop the tools that we need so that we can rely more heavily on God in those lonely times. People who serve the church, they need maturity. You know, whatever kind of ministry you have, you need to grow deeper because you need to develop an ear so that you can hear God's voice. You need to develop habits that feed your soul. And if, you're, if you oversee other believers, you certainly need to be close to God to tap into his wisdom. In other words, all Christians need to grow deeper, regardless of the number of years they've been a Christian or the length of their service of their ministry. No one is exempt here. If you say that you are a Christian, the aim is to grow more mature in your Christian life. How do you do that? You follow the Acts chapter two guide. And they are the things that we have already talked about. You devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is the same as what? Saying the Bible, right? Included in those 3,000 converts. We should take note that the people who devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching included the 3,000 that were added to the church that same day. The apostles put importance to the growth of these people by having them sit and listen to the teaching of the Word of God. And it was that event that made new believers mature. Joshua 1.8 says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
We're down here praying all the time. God, tell me what to do. Show me the way to go. And he's shouting back, I already sent you a book. (laughs) Read that. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship with believers. Ephesians 2.19 says you are a member of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Notice it doesn't say the church is like a family. It says the church is a family. And it says you belong in God's household. In the Greek, that's the word hagios oikos. Hagios is holy, oikos, family. The church is your spiritual family. Being a part of a church, joining a church, assures that we collectively build on this strong shared foundation of faith. Creating a church family is community. And it's what helps us all advance in Christ. And God expects me to be a member of a church family. Notice the Bible says you are a member of God's very own family. So I would say, I can't argue with that. I can't say, I'm not a member. God says you are a member. I used to sit uh, in a group that used to hire people for a Christian university. And we each got to ask our own couple of questions. It was a group interview. And one of my interview questions was, where do you go to church? And one time we had this guy say, well, I don't go to church because I believe that you can sit in a beautiful field of flowers and have church. Or, you know, you can go into your closet and you can have church. A Christian doesn't need other people to worship God. And everyone around the table with me was like, meh, we're not hiring this guy. Did you know that there are over 30 commands in the Bible that you can't even obey unless you are part of a church? A Christian without a church family is like a person who says, well, I want to play in the NFL, but I don't want to play on a team. You know, I really, I want to join the army, but I don't want to be in a platoon. You know, I want to be a bee, but I don't want to belong to the hive. I want to play an instrument, but I don't want to be in the orchestra. The simple fact is we need each other in our Christian faith. You need to understand that when it says the word church in the Bible, it's used two different ways. First, it refers to every single Christian that has lived throughout history. That's called the universal church. Sometimes we call that the Catholic church. Every believer all around the world, regardless of their denomination, regardless of label, regardless of whether they meet in a building or not, or a tent, or a little hut, they are all part of the universal church. But the other way church is used is as a local group, as a specific place. This is the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia means a group of people, and it has nothing to do with a building. The Bible talks about the church that met at Corinth, the church that met in Lydia's house, the church that was on the hill. The church was a local community place. The word church is only used four times in the entire Bible to refer to all of us in the general sense. So every other time we see the word church in the Bible, it's used to refer to a specific group of believers, just like what we have here in Walden. And the only difference is, once you become a believer, you are automatically a part of the universal church. You are automatically, that moment that you became a Christian, you automatically became a part of the global church, but you don't become part of a local church until you make that choice. That's why we're having a membership class on October 13th. And we'll talk about all of this. And at that class, we're gonna explain what it means to be saved. We're gonna talk about what's expected of you. And we're gonna talk about how you can share your faith with others. What else do we see the early church do? They have food. They break bread, right? Now this is either sitting around a table and having a meal together, like we we do when we have a potluck, or it can be receiving the elements of communion. Both are things that we should be doing. You know, the communion bread restores the community we have with God. But the potluck, or going to somebody else's house, 
that restores the community we have with each other. And both of these things are needed. Listen, church is not a Sunday morning activity. Our church is open six days a week. And we pretty much have stuff going on six days a week. And I know we don't all have time to do everything, but we need to start making some time. I am open to ideas. More dinners in homes, more Bible studies in homes. If you have an idea or something you'd like the church to do, grab a connection card, or better yet, fill out our online survey. And you can go to waldenchurch.com, click the banner, and start taking that survey. What's the last thing we see happening in the Acts 2 church? They pray. We're not going to be able to accomplish a single thing if we don't pray. This is why we're starting a prayer night on October 23rd. And we'll have a second one on November 13th. Let's stop saying thoughts and prayers and actually pray. Let's stop saying, I'll pray for you. Instead, pray for them right there. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Lord's care and guidance. So we need to pray. That's how we become more mature. But the first part of the church is more Christians, right? It's growth. Who does our local church reach? The first group we have to reach as we grow and mature in the Lord is the group we've already reached. Do you know Christians who don't go to church or who casually go to church? Christians who've walked away from church. It's time to start repairing relationships and bringing the sheep back into the pen. Who would you invite? Any of the people within our reach, right? If they are within your reach, if they are your acquaintance, if, if you talk to them regularly, they are easily reachable because they are in the circle of people that are already within your reach, literally. But not just for the purpose of bringing them to Jesus. Who is in your book club, card club? Who do you see at work or PTA or neighbors or hairdressers or cashiers or your mailman? Strike up a casual conversation and just simply ask them, where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? And if they attend someplace regularly, if they serve and they love it, then great. Remember, we are all the church globally. We have a global body and we have a local body. But if they only go to so-and-so church once in a while and they're not really invested and they don't go that often, invite them to church. 63% of Americans say a personal invitation from a friend or a neighbor would be effective in getting them to come and visit your church. 63% percent. Most people will say yes. Eight out of ten will say yes to a personal invite to church. Once we reach those who are already reached, then we go to the unreached group. Those are the people who are not in our groups. Those are people outside of our circle of friends. Of course we need to reach them too, but it'll take some extra effort. It'll take extra time. So how do we reach and extend our reach even wider. We need to learn to share our faith. We need to begin to serve outside the walls of the church. The work of the church is not finished. Our work is not finished. At the end of the day, the thing we should be striving for is to build on earth what Jesus worked and did while he was here. He saved people, he spent time with friends, he shared his feelings vulnerably, he challenged and uh, was intolerant to sin, he confronted hypocrisy, all the while creating a culture of love and humility. And if you're at the point in your life where you equate church with rules and social status or cliques or tradition or routine, I say it's time to refocus on what the kingdom is supposed to be like. It's not a club. It's not something that we shape to our liking, but rather it's a living thing. 
It is comprised of imperfect people, and we are all trying our best to keep the message of Jesus alive. And if we approach life with the intention that we are going to put his kingdom first and his will be done, then I think we'll all be a little bit more understanding of each other and the impact of Christ's church will be felt. And who knows, next week we may have 3,000 people that we have to find seats for. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your church. She is beautiful. Your bride has always been beautiful. Help us to continue to prepare her for you, to adorn her. Lord, may all your churches grow healthily in community. May churches learn to restore community, to walk across the room, to shake hands, to smile, but also to walk across the street, to walk to the neighbor's house, to talk to our cashiers and our waitresses, to talk to the people who come and fix our homes. May we share the love and the forgiveness of Jesus daily. We thank you for the way that our church is free to worship you without fear. May it embolden us more to be brave, to share the gospel, and ultimately to see your kingdom come. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Thank you for tuning in and watching this video. Of course, I would remind you that church takes place here every Sunday, right? Church takes place here every Sunday. One of the things we say around here is church where you live, because it means two things. One, we are the church where you live, but two, church should be a verb. We should church where we live. We should practice church where we live. To church to our neighbors, church to our friends, church to the school next door, church to the firemen across the street, church to the people that cut our lawns. We have two services every Sunday. One is at 9.30. We have a traditional choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to sing the doxology. We're going to have potlucks. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And then between services, we have coffee and donuts. All are invited. Please come and be a part of fellowship. And then we have a second service at 11 o'clock. We have a contemporary worship band. We're going to sing contemporary songs. Come casual. Come however you feel best. And we have a youth program from children, from birth, all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.